Tonight on behalf of the Story County Bar Association and the University Pre-Legal Education Committee and the Committee on Lectures, we want to welcome you to the Law Day Lecture for 1980. I was thinking about something to say about Law Day today and I thought of the words that Charles Dickens used to describe a different time when he said it was the best of times and the worst of times spring of hope and the winter of despair. It seems to me that on Law Day 1980, we face some of those same considerations. But Law Day is not a celebration of, of this day alone. It's not a celebration of the limitations of law among men and nations. It's a celebration of the development of the law development of the laudable underpinnings of our legal society and of the development of society in the last 200 years in this country and in the last 750 some years since the Magna Carta. It's a day to honor the success of the law and the meaning and significance of the law in our society. Tonight we're very fortunate to have a, our, as our guest speaker, Mr. Justice Mark McCormick of the Iowa Supreme Court. Mr. McCormick is a native of Fort Dodge. He received his legal education at Georgetown University, served as clerk to Chief Judge Harvey Johnson of the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. And in 1968, he was appointed to the bench of the Iowa District Court and to the Iowa Supreme Court in 1972. Justice McCormick will speak to us tonight on the topic of the Iowa Constitution and the new federalism. I take very great pleasure in presenting to you Justice Mark McCormick. I appreciate very much the opportunity to face you tonight. The subject that I've selected to talk about is one that uh, I try to tailor to the law day somewhat. I hope background. on its complexities. This early evening when my wife was getting ready to come, she asked me whether this was going to be dull and boring or fun and exciting. And I said, how does one talk about the law and a subject as technical as this and make it fun and exciting? So I can't promise fun and excitement, but I'm going to try to talk about this subject in a way that it won't sound like a legal opinion. Uh, Iowa has a proud tradition of freedom. In 1839, our territorial court, in its first decision, decided a case involving a slave named Ralph. Of course, slaves had only one name, so we don't know anything about Ralph other than that he was black, a slave, was owned by someone in Missouri who had sent him into Iowa with a promise that if he went to work in the lead mines in Dubuque, which was Iowa's main industry at that time, and earned $550, which he sent to his master, and it would take him, I'm sure, a considerable length of time to amass that kind of a sum. But he could earn his freedom. And Ralph, on this representation, with this kind of arrangement, told his owner that it was a deal, and he came to Iowa. But once he got here, Iowa was a free state in which there was no slavery. And the Missouri Compromise said that in states other than Missouri, north of a certain latitude, 
there would be no slavery. Iowa, by choice, in any event, was a free territory where there was no slavery. Ralph went to court to try to have his freedom established without being required to carry out his contract. He didn't want to have to work in the lead mines to earn this $550 to earn his right to freedom. He said, I came from a slave state. Now I'm in a free territory, and I should be free because you can't have slavery in this territory. And in its very first decision, the Iowa Territorial Court, which was comprised of three judges, who later became, after Iowa became a state, the same three judges who, who were the first Iowa Supreme Court, decided that Ralph was right and that you simply cannot have the status of slavery or the badge of slavery in a free territory. His right to be a free man without carrying out his bargain with his owner was established. And the court decided the case on simple principles of fairness and logic from the standpoint of the status of Iowa, the territory of Iowa under the Organic Act that governed it at that time, as being a free territory. There being no slavery here, there can be no slaves here. Well, that was fine for Iowa, and that became the law of the Iowa Territory, and Ralph was free. But in 1857, the United States Supreme Court, when faced with almost an identical factual situation, except the slave was from somewhere else, decided the case that we know today as the Dred Scott decision. And in that decision, the Supreme Court of the United States reached a different conclusion. It said, once a slave, always a slave, unless the owner grants freedom in some recognized legal way. A slave did not become free by going into a free state or territory. They reasoned that there was no violation of the United States Constitution because the framers of the United States Constitution had not treated slaves as persons or as citizens of the United States entitled to any of the protections of the Constitution. Instead, they were property. And as a matter of, of historical precedent, there was some force to this reasoning because some one quarter of the members of the first Constitutional Convention were slave owners. It matters little or mattered little to the court that that issue had not been raised in the case. The case actually raised the more narrow question of whether the, under the Missouri Compromise, Dred Scott should have been free as Ralph argued he should be free. But the court reached out for reasons which you can read about in the history books and decided that slaves are property, they're not persons or citizens, they're not constitutionally protected. So what do we do in this federal system when we're confronted with a local entity of government, in this case the territory of Iowa and later the state of Iowa, which has one standard for protecting human rights and recognizing human rights, and the United States Supreme Court, the federal government, which establishes a different standard. A poll was taken about a year ago in this country, which established that the majority of persons in the United States who, in accordance with this allegedly scientific survey, uh, gave their views, believed that the United States Supreme Court, or the federal courts, had the right to override state courts and state authorities in any instance that the federal authorities chose to do so. And this is simply not true. It is part of the constitutional law of this country part of the supreme law of the land, 
that a decision at the state level which rests on an adequate state ground cannot be touched by the federal authority so long as no federal right is involved. So that state courts and state authorities who make decisions to extend protections to the citizens within their borders have a right to do that and to rest their decisions on state grounds, notwithstanding that the federal government, in a case involving a federal question, a federal constitutional or statutory question, has the last word in those events on matters of state law and state constitutional law, so long as a federal right is not infringed, the state courts and the state authorities have the last word. And that's one of the glories, one of the goals and objectives of our federal system. I want to suggest to you that we are living at a time when it is important to consider again the relationship between the states and the federal government with respect to the protections of individuals within the borders of these entities. We went through a period in the 1960s, which we refer to in the history of constitutional law as the era of the Warren Court. This was a period of time in which the United States Supreme Court, as a matter of federal constitutional law, gradually, steadily, somewhat aggressively, extended the protections of the Federal Bill of Rights to the citizens of the states in their relations to the states, to state action. This was against a background in which state courts, at least it was demonstrated to the satisfaction of the majority from time to time of the United States Supreme Court, had demonstrated an unworthiness to be trusted with the protection of the rights of citizens within their borders, particularly with respect to what the United States Supreme Court first conceived to be fundamental rights which were to be protected under the 14th Amendment of the Federal Constitution. Do you realize that it took almost 100 years for the 14th Amendment of the Federal Constitution to mean very much in the lives of the citizens of this country. It was a radical idea in the 1960s that the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments of the United States Constitution, could have any application to the citizens of the states. So that, for example, where we were talking about freedom of speech and association, was thought that unless the state in its constitution or local law afforded some protection against state action which would infringe those rights, the federal constitution would not have application. And you could go down the list of the Bill of Rights and find similar views. There were a few persons who thought that when the 14th Amendment of the Constitution was adopted. It was one of the intentions of the framers of that amendment and the people in going through the amendment process in approving it that the 14th Amendment of the Federal Constitution had as one of its purposes in providing for equal protection of the laws and assurances of due process to the citizens of the state that in our federal system, the citizens of the states would be entitled to the protections of the Bill of Rights. And the process of the Warren Court was largely a process of carrying that theory into reality. Because one today can look at few protections in the Bill of Rights and find that they have not been federalized with respect to their applicability now in the states. The right to counsel, that is the right to a defendant in a serious criminal case, to be represented by a lawyer, 
is a matter of federal constitutional right. A similar Sixth Amendment right to confront one's accusers, which was in the federal constitution, but not in some state constitutions or local law, has been federalized. And the process then of the Warren Court was largely, in the criminal law area, to federalize criminal procedure in our states so that states were forced into a position, kicking, screaming, dragged in some instances, certainly against their will and against popular opinion in many instances in this country, to recognize rights which were assured under the federal constitution, now within the boundaries of the states. We got in the position then, at the end of this incorporation process, where lawyers, judges, and the public at large thought the federal constitution was the beginning and the end of things. And we found in my practice and period of time on the bench that we started to look first and sometimes only to the federal constitution for vindication of rights. And we still today have cases coming to the Supreme Court of Iowa which will cite and refer to provisions of the federal constitution alleging infringement or violations, which will not even mention the Iowa constitution. And this is the constitution that governed the citizens of Iowa. This is the same one we've had since 1857, and it governed us entirely until the Warren Court started with basically the map against Ohio decision in 1962, in which forced the exclusionary rule on the states in search and seizure cases to tell the states that they could not deprive the citizens in the states of these now federally assured rights. So from a period in which all we had to protect us was the Iowa Constitution and local law so far as our basic rights were concerned, we came to the point where we began to think that all we had to protect us was the federal constitution. And the state constitutions were virtually forgotten. Then we entered the 1970s, and what constitutional critics are referring to as the Burger Court. And this is a time in which constitutional law is not evolving and extending protections to citizens of the states, certainly not with the same predictability and the same consistency as under the Warren Court. In fact, some of the decisions of the Warren Court have been overruled or modified in a way that they have been cut back and protections have been lessened. And now some of the states and citizens of the states and state courts and state authorities are not happy. We played follow the leader for 10 years. And now the question is whether we will continue to follow the leader with respect to these protections that our citizens have. Do we have a choice? And if we have a choice, what should the choice be? We no longer have a situation where our state courts and state authorities are simply trying not to be outrun by the United States Supreme Court. We have a situation where state courts and local authorities are having to decide whether every time there is an ebb and flow in a theory or a principle of constitutional law at the federal level, the state courts must follow it as a matter of state constitutional law. The reason that we're in this predicament is that we have similar language in many of our state constitutions to that in the Federal Bill of Rights. And we got very lazy as lawyers and judges in the various states during the period of the Warren Court. Most of our state court decisions had not recognized the same rights, the same principles as were being forced on the states as a matter of constitutional law. But we had the same language in our state constitutions. 
And when litigants would raise in our courts questions about whether or not there were infringements of federal constitutional rights and state constitutional rights where the language in the constitutions, these broad, general, simple statements of principle, meant the same thing under both constitutions, we took the easy way out more often than not. And we said, because the language is substantially similar, we reached the same conclusion under our own constitution. So this left us in a position at the end of the Warren Court era of having said that the Fourth Amendment under the federal constitution means the same thing as the prohibition against unlawful searches and seizure under the Iowa Constitution. So we didn't have to distinguish in principle between what the Iowa Constitution might require, whether it, considered independently, for example, would require the exclusionary rule, the exclusion of tainted evidence, evidence that had been unlawfully obtained, while the federal Constitution in its Fourth Amendment had such a requirement as a matter of United States Supreme Court interpretation. We said language is the same. We conclude that our Constitution means the same thing. So what do we do now in the 1970s when the United States Supreme Court says, well, the Warren Court said that the United States Constitution meant this, or the due process required, due process of law required thus. But we disagree. We differ. We cut back. We overrule. What do we do then in these cases that raise questions under the Iowa Constitution in which we have parroted United States Supreme Court principles? Do we follow in lockstep and say, oh, yes, we were wrong too. We meant something different too. Our Constitution now means what the federal court says the federal Constitution means. Or do we chart an independent course. This is the choice we have. I think to understand that we have the choice and what choice we should make, we ought to consider a little bit about the nature of the federal system. In thinking about this subject and trying to get ready to talk about it, I reread the Federalist Papers within the last few weeks to see exactly what the framers were arguing the Federal Constitutional Bill of Rights were intended to do with respect to the states. And of course, as you know, the Bill of Rights were, was not part of the original Constitution. When the Articles of Confederation uh, developed so many kinks that the states recognized they had to do something had to tune them up, which is what they originally started out to do, or adopt some different kind of scheme of government, the problems were largely economic, having to do with relationships of trade and printing of money and those kinds of relationships. They got into the Constitutional Convention and they realized that they were going to have to get into a, a major overhaul of the structure. But they were still treating the former colonies as being like independent nations. And this is why we're told we refer to the entities as states, just as international terminology would refer to nations as states today. These were little nations that were getting together trying to draft a constitution. And they, they weren't paying much attention to the question of a Bill of Rights. They were too worried about the bread and butter issues that they conceived faced them with respect to what kind of basic structure there would be, the powers of government, in relation to the people, but they were of a view that the federal government would have such a limited role in relation to the states, at least Alexander Hamilton expressed it, that there wasn't any real necessity to get into listing specific rights because that might imply that the federal government had more power than the framers actually intended to give it. It was only in the closing days of the convention that George Mason of Virginia suggested there ought to be a Bill of Rights in the federal constitution. Now, every one of the states, as part of its basic law, had by that time a Bill of Rights in its own constitution. Every one of the 
elements in the Federal Bill of Rights that now exists was in one or more of the state constitutional Bill of Rights, which existed at the time of the Constitutional Convention. Some of the states, when the Bill of Rights that George Mason proposed was not put in the Federal Constitution, refused to ratify it until assurances were made that it would be promptly amended upon the convening of the first Congress. And as we know, this is what was done. They went to their first meeting in New York, and one of the first items of business was the matter of adopting a Bill of Rights. They had proposals that came from a lot of sources. Where did they look for what would be put in the Federal Bill of Rights? They looked to the state constitutions. So, for example, from Virginia, from Massachusetts, from Pennsylvania, from New York, and from other states, they took the language that ended up in the federal constitution. So it is not as if the Bill of Rights is a product of the original thinking of the framers of the federal constitution or of the first Congress. In fact, the principles in the Bill of Rights, as you know, which were in the state constitutions, were not original. As we know, the, the Revolutionary War in this country was not fought because the citizens of England were being denied protections, but because the residents of the colonies were being denied protections that the citizens of England had. And they had many of the freedoms and protections of the Bill of Rights. And they'd had them since Magna Carta. And they had existed in many nations to one degree or another to some extent uh, through history because these are basic human rights which some persons have advocated since the beginning of man's organizing into communities. So there, there's nothing sacred about the role of the framers of the federal constitution and the amenders of it having adopted the first 10 amendments in the federal constitution. This was not innovative or original or creative or particularly distinctive. One of the other things that's in the Federalist Papers is that it's inherent in the federal system that it was designed to try to create an advantage in this country over systems of government, even in democracies or republics, which might be created in other countries, and England, for example, having the parliamentary structure or the national republic or the national system, in the sense that there was a, a goal or an objective of trying to arrive at a double security. There would be a system of checks and balances on the power of government at the federal level among the branches and, re and in relation of that government to the people, but there would be a separate governmental structure at the state level which would operate also on a system of checks and balances within the structure and with designated responsibilities in relation to the people, but which would also operate as a check on the federal system, the federal government, and the federal government through the supremacy clause, of course, operating as a check on state government. The, the writers, particularly James Madison in the Federalist Papers, uh, emphasized that there was a feeling or a view that the system was designed so that there would be double security to protect human rights, and that's the term that he used. So historically, at least, first, there isn't anything particularly significant uh, or binding or sacred about the Bill of Rights having at some time in our history appeared in the federal constitution insofar as the state's rights are concerned in extending freedoms to the citizens in their borders. And second, there is 
something important about the structure of the federal system which depends on the states acting independently when it seems appropriate to them in relation to the citizens. They have a responsibility to do so. We now then come to the, the question, we have a choice. The question is, ought we to exercise it in Iowa? Ought we now to say that the Iowa Constitution means what we truly believe it should mean without regard to possibly differing views of the United States Supreme Court with respect to similar language in the federal Constitution? We've had three principal views among the states in making that choice. One view is that there is a certain compulsion on the part of the states to follow the interpretations of the Federal Bill of Rights in interpreting State Bill of Rights. And some states, conceitedly, will lockstep with the United States Supreme Court. This group is in a minority. A second group in which we've wandered from time to time in Iowa is to choose to follow the United States Supreme Court as a matter of harmony and convenience and to say it'll be simpler, less complex to say our citizens under the Iowa Constitution have identical rights as the United States Supreme Court says the citizens have under the federal constitution. So this is a question of convenience. The third view, which is probably the more thoroughly articulated and reasoned view among the states, is that the decisions of the United States Supreme Court interpreting similar language will be treated as merely persuasive authority in the state courts. And the state courts will decide for themselves whether they're willing to be persuaded or not. Depending upon the logic and the cogency of the arguments that have been advanced in the decisions of the United States Supreme Court. So we've had, for example, a number of state court decisions in recent years, in the late 1970s particularly, in which state courts have refused to lockstep with decisions of the United States Supreme Court, which the state courts have viewed as regressive or as cutting back or as not consistent with state views. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples, the United States Supreme Court in a case uh, named Robinson decided a few years ago that when officers made an arrest of a person, no matter what the reason for the arrest, the basis of the arrest, they had a right under the Fourth Amendment of the Federal Constitution, and as applied to the states through the Fourteenth Amendment, to search that individual in any way in order to see what might turn up. So that any search incident to an arrest was lawful and reasonable and permissible under the Fourth Amendment. Well, a couple of state courts we have an independent right and a duty to say what our state constitutions mean. And they may mean something different than the federal constitution means to the United States Supreme Court. So, in effect, we look to our own Constitution. And looking to their own tradition, and looking to the principles in their own prior cases, those courts came to the conclusion that they would not recognize this principle. They would say that a search within their borders made incident to an arrest could not be made carte blanche unless it was reasonable in addition to being incident to an arrest. So they imposed an additional impediment to the legality of the search under the state constitutions. 
And this they had a right to do. So when a search question arises now in those states which have followed this principle, a litigant may challenge the legality of the search under the federal constitution. The same person may challenge the legality of the search under the state constitution. And it may pass constitutional muster under the federal constitution, but it may not pass under the state constitution because the requirement of the state constitution is more rigid. The protection which has been extended is greater. Another example. The United States Supreme Court had a celebrated case involving the kind of consent that is necessary to authorize an invasion of privacy. The issue was, in this Shekloff case, whether or not the person allegedly giving consent had to know he had a right to refuse it before it could be said that he had given up his right to privacy. The United States Supreme Court in the 70s said he does not have to know, the person does not have to know that he has the right to refuse to consent to a search of his home or his castle. It is enough that he has, in fact, given his permission. That's all the Constitution requires. So this question has come up in state courts. And state courts, most notably New Jersey, when the issue has been raised under the state constitution, has said that under the state constitution, the person must know of his right to refuse permission before it can be said that he has intelligently consented to the invasion of his privacy. If he is not demonstrated to have known of his right to refuse, he has not waived his right of privacy, the search is unlawful, the evidence may not be used. Now whether one agrees or not with the choices that have been made in these states, one cannot dispute their right to have made those choices under their state constitutions. Those, those decisions then are made on adequate state grounds and no federal court, including the United States Supreme Court, can upset them. So what do we do in Iowa? We have not really been challenged, as some of the other states have, to say whether or not we think the Iowa Constitution might, in some instances, not require us to lockstep with the United States Supreme Court. However, as exemplified by Ralph's case, we have every reason in Iowa to think that we should seriously consider whether or not we ought not to examine our options when the choice is presented. In the Ralph case, our territorial court thought that a slave ought to be free when he came into free territory. The United States Supreme Court, even quite a few years later, in Dred Scott, disagreed. Ought not we have the right, if Iowans believe that the slave should have been free, to premise that holding on a state law ground and have it sustained? We've had other cases in our history which have indicated, I think, and, and have demonstrated the strength of our tradition of freedom in this state. We had a school case in this state in 1868 in which a local school district had attempted to operate a separate school for black students. That is, we had segregated schools in one of our Iowa communities in this immediate post-war period. We had a statute in Iowa that said that school children were to have equal opportunity for education between the ages of 5 and 21, I believe. The Iowa court was confronted with the question whether or not under that statute we in this state could approve separate but conceivably equal schools. And this court held very forcefully in that 1868 decision that 
in Iowa a school which was separate, even if equal, violated the statute. And segregated schools were not permitted. Now, this was a case decided under state statute rather than under a constitutional provision, but the court reasoned that our Constitution at that time made no distinction on the basis of race, just as it made no distinction on the basis of nationality or how a person dressed or his economic condition, so that the burden on one who claimed that to make this kind of distinction was permissible or not was to show that it was expressly authorized and that when one had a statute uh, which said that all youth have a right to equal educational opportunity, the burden was on the person attempting to defend segregation to overcome the presumption that separate was not equal and that the same kind of distinction could be made on other grounds than race and could be justified. This was a strong affirmation by this, the court in this state. And it's, it's significant, of course, it was easier in Iowa to, to believe in these principles because our economy was not dependent on slavery or servitude and uh, putting uh, races down as the economy was in states with different traditions. But we had a strong tradition, uh, which I think is exemplified real well, and if you've got some time, there, there really is nothing that, uh, nothing that could be more interesting in terms of constitutional history in this state than the reading of the debates of the 1857 Constitutional Convention to see a strong sentiment among the framers of the Iowa Constitution against slavery and against the fugitive slave law that would let people come in and take slaves back who had escaped uh, to free states. We, we had this tradition here, and it was not until 1954, almost 100 years later, that this right was established by the United States Supreme Court as a matter of federal constitutional law. So, the right existed in Iowa, which could not be assured to citizens in other states a long time before it was recognized in those places. We have another decision, 1873, in which a mulatto, or quadroon, the opinion refers to her as, who was a school teacher in Quincy, Illinois, was going to ride a ferry boat from Burlington, Iowa, back to Quincy. And the company would sell her a ticket to ride on the boat, but it would not sell her a ticket which would include the right to eat at the first class table because of her color. And she first asserted her right to get a ticket that would be available to anyone else and was refused. And she caused a little commotion so she ended up buying the ticket for the passage only and not for the meal. But she found a white man on the boat who would go buy her a meal ticket, which would enable her to eat at the white folks' table. And he did this for her. And she sat down to eat with the white people. And the people who were running the boat tried to get her to move. And a scuffle followed. And she was bodily removed from this table. The theory of the company was that they made a contract with her when they sold her her ticket. She didn't pay for sitting at the table as part of her original passage, and she would not have to pay as much to sit at the first class table if she sat where they said she had a right to sit. So she wasn't being penalized, she would get what she was permitted to pay for if she sat with the segregated group. Well, she brought an assault and battery action against the uh, people that had pushed her around on this boat. And it just, you have to remark at the, uh, at the courage of this person in that day and age in initiating an action against a steamboat company, as she did, charging them with assault and battery. And it, upon a charge to the jury which stated 
the law to be that she had a right under the federal and state constitutions to sit where everyone else could sit so long as she paid the price of the ticket. The officials were convicted in an Iowa court by an Iowa jury, and the steamship company appealed to the Iowa Supreme Court. So we have this Coger decision in 1873 where the Iowa court decided that under the Iowa Constitution, the very first article, the very first section of the Iowa Constitution, she had a right to do what she was trying to do. That first section in the first article says that all men, and now the Attorney General says that also means women, are created free and equal. And the court sustained her right and upheld the conviction of the authorities who had tried to kick her off the boat. Well, in 1896, 20 years later, the United States Supreme Court had virtually the same question in Plessy against Ferguson, involving the, the right to segregate the races on a train. And that court, by majority vote, said that the United States Constitution did not give the person on this public accommodation the right to an integrated facility or the right to the same, occupy the same space as a person of a different race. And it was not until the fallout from the Brown decision that this law was changed at the federal level. But it had been the law in Iowa under the state constitution since 1873. Well, uh, I guess all of this proves that at least back in 1860s and the 1870s, the Iowa court may have been relatively progressive and relatively enlightened. What could we expect today? Well, there, there are at least two things, two events, I think, which have occurred in recent years to indicate that we still have some feeling in this state of not only a right, but a responsibility to look to state law and not only to federal law in determining what the rights of our people should be. One example of it is the movement in this state to adopt an equal rights amendment. This is an example of the Iowa legislature and now eventually the people at the ballot box will have an opportunity to determine their views on it to decide whether we ought to put a requirement or a right in the Iowa Constitution, which has not been successfully put in the federal Constitution. So here we are going to have a unique opportunity for the people to express themselves on whether they wish the Iowa Constitution to extend a right, which has not been yet put in the federal Constitution. A second thing that has happened is that under our state Civil Rights Act, our present Supreme Court has manifested an inclination to give broader endorsement to the rights secured than the United States Supreme Court has under comparable language in the federal civil rights statutes. This is significant because those federal statutes uh, contain the language on which our provisions are modeled. But we can look, just like the United States Supreme Court, at what the intent was of the Federal Congress in adopting that language, and we can decide whether we agree with them as to their view of what was intended in those statutes when we're referring to the language that was copied but was put in our state statutes. So for example, when in the uh, General Electric case, the United States Supreme Court by split decision said that uh, private employers' insurance benefit did not have to include coverage for pregnancy. Uh, our court, when confronted with exactly the same question under the, exactly the same language but in a state statute, could say, we read the federal Congress's intent differently in adopting that statute, and we in, therefore reach a different conclusion and find the obligation, although the United States Supreme Court did not find it under the federal constitution. So we have some 
reason to believe that we ought to be giving consideration to the provisions of our state constitution as well as the federal constitution and consider seriously whether we need to continue to follow the leader in making constitutional adjudications. There are dangers in this. There are legitimate arguments that undesirable complexity could be introduced into our lives if we have one standard federally and a different standard at the state level. Divergence ought not to be undertaken lightly. It ought to be seriously considered and thoroughly justified. But this is no more to say than that we should give uh, persuasive impact to the decisions of the United States Supreme Court interpreting the identical language in the federal constitution. Give those decisions the weight that their, re their reasoning and logic would indicate that, that they're entitled to have. Not differ simply for the sake of disagreeing, but differ only when we can disagree with the logic and the persuasive force of the similar interpretations. A second danger is that state courts tend to be more activist. Now, all of you who've had any kind of study of constitutional law know that there was a period in this country when the United States Supreme Court uh, virtually told the Federal Congress what kind of economic regulations could be imposed or not. The somewhat infamous Lochner decision after the turn of the century uh, upset kind of a, a sweatshop law as a matter of what was called substance, substantive due process. In any event, we had a court until uh, some of the pressures during the 1930s, which frequently would interfere as a matter of federal constitutional law with state level economic regulation. And then we moved the other way. The dissenting view prevailed in the United States Supreme Court, and the court began to look upon the states as kind of laboratories where different kinds of economic experimentation should be permitted and the right of states to legislate to promote the general welfare and safety ought to be encouraged and the United States Supreme Court should be loath to interfere. Now most of the same people who want state courts to extend freedoms to their people beyond those recognized by the United States Supreme Court also want that kind of principle to endure, even under state constitutions. They don't want state courts to be telling uh, state legislatures that they cannot pass what we traditionally have recognized as public welfare laws. Uh, we have a tendency at the state court level, because we're under different pressures, I think, than federal courts, to legislate or to want to legislate. There's, there's a temptation if you don't like the law to strike it or to want to strike it. So there, there is this impulse to activism, the pressure to activism, which I believe does not exist at the federal level. So we, we do have some reasons for, for caution. Uh, on the other hand, all of the reasons which have been used in the state court decisions which have extended protections to their people. Uh, the fact that it hasn't been a runaway pattern on the part of these state courts. The fact that we have this unique and proud tradition of freedom in this state, I think ought to encourage us toward being willing to take the chance and when appropriate to make a decision on an adequate state ground, even though we know that the United States Supreme Court would not share that view under the federal constitution. This is the only way, really, that the framers' idea of this double security, this principle of double security from the two levels of government and the two structures of government uh, can be effectively realized. And it's really the only way that our state constitutions are going to be viable again, or we will really appreciate our heritage under them 
and be truly responsive to the, the traditions and the views of our own citizens as opposed to the citizens of uh, another governmental entity which might have different views. Now, all of this, I think, has to be understood from the perspective that we talk about, particularly on Law Day, the fact that we live under a rule of law in this country. But no one should believe for a minute, and I'm sure none of you does believe for very long, that one can actually look to the black letter in a constitution or in a statute to decide how a controversy should come out. As a matter of fact, those decisions are made through the reasoning of groups of persons charged with the responsibility of interpreting those instruments. The framers could not and did not anticipate the problems, the complexity of life with which we are confronted. But isn't it remarkable that we in Iowa have lived under the same Constitution since 1857 and have not felt the need to meet again to draft a new Constitution? And we have lived in this country under a federal constitution, which has been relatively untouched by substantive amendments since the Bill of Rights were adopted. And even one of those amendments, prohibition, turned out to be a mistake. But the reason that these constitutions have survived and have continued to be the source of our decisions is not because they themselves are the beginning and the end of the rule of law, but because combined with our system of precedence in which courts will follow as consistently as they reasonably can their prior decisions and the logic of their prior decisions and the principles which have been recognized in them, in the application to new problems that are presented, the extent to which this doctrine of stare decisis has prevailed in our system and is inherent in it, and the willingness of courts to recognize the necessity of flexibility of the language of those documents in its application to new problems have been the secrets to the survival of those documents. Those decisions, however, are decisions that are, that are not dictated by the framers of the instruments or by some omnipresence in the sky, but by human beings who are simply bringing to bear on the problems their best judgment. And that judgment is no better than the integrity of the institution and the integrity of the people who are making those decisions. So we, we trust to the integrity of institutions and people when we recognize there is a rule of law in this country, but it is really a rule of human beings who have sub subjected their personal views and judgments to what they believe is demanded of them by this ideal of the rule of law. Uh, so in pursuing rights of Iowans in this federal system under the Iowa Constitution, we have to keep that in mind. We do not have the freedom to be irresponsible. We do not have the freedom to say what we would like our legislation to be. We have the freedom only to say what we believe our Constitution means as it applies to new problems which were not anticipated earlier and are not answered in the black letter of the documents. Isn't it marvelous what courts have been able to get out of the constitutions in such simple and brief language such as that no person shall be deprived of his right to life, liberty, and property without due process of law and how many thousands and thousands of pages have been written in our books about what that language means in the solution of specific problems. The success of our system depends upon those who apply those provisions being able to solve them by doing so. And the broad 
and beautifully general language of the documents. So the rule of law is not self-executing. It depends upon our efforts and our integrity and that of our institutions. The only other thing that I want to suggest after advocating that we look to state law is that we who are in the legal system, and you who are not but who are citizens of this country, ought to be thinking when you have a problem that you want resolved in our courts. To look first, not second, to state law and our state constitution. If you do not find your remedy there, then look to federal constitution and federal statute for your rights. And this will put the federal system in the balance that at least the structure of the system is intended to have. You have the assurance that if the state authorities go awry in their determination of what your rights are, what your remedies are, that when federal questions are involved, that is where, the, where federal rights are infringed, you will have a remedy in the federal system. When Virginia, more than 200 years ago, adopted its Declaration of Rights, parts of which got into the Federal Bill of Rights and parts of which have been copied into our own state constitution, there's one thing that was said that I think uh, points up the main principle that I'm attempting to communicate to you in suggesting that our state constitution must be made a viable and meaningful document and the federal system must be made to be truly federal in accordance with its purpose. And this statement is that no free government nor the blessings of liberty can be preserved to any people but by a fair adherence to justice and by frequent recurrence to fundamental principles. Thank you.